and welcome to Virtual Concert Hall's live music channel. My name is Chris Au and I have with me the amazing co-founder of Virtual Concert Hall's Dr. Anna Osmanskaya. Thank you, Chris, and thank you everyone for joining. What a pleasure to be back again Absolutely. and co-hosting these wonderful programs. Um, I'm enjoying them immensely. I hope you all mm -hmm. do too. Yeah, and this is part three of the documentary of Beethoven's first symphony, written and narrated by Lawrence Rapchak, created by New Media Productions Worldwide and Virtual Concert Halls, as well as produced by the Architects of Music. And I'm very grateful for this incredible collaboration with these wonderful organizations and especially the people who are taking part in creating those films. And this collaboration definitely has been made possible by our shared passion to bring musicians, music events and programs in real time to our audiences from around the globe. standard practice to repeat the entire exposition so that the audience could hear all of the main materials again before plunging into the central development section. Where Beethoven uses a device that's very common with composers, many of whom struggled with the process of true symphonic writing. It's taking a theme from the exposition. Say, take our main theme. And many, many composers in the coming years would fall back on this device because it's all they knew how to do. Simply repeat the theme in different keys and with different accompaniments. So this might become this. Or maybe this. Etc. And you just kind of go around the block several times in different keys. Now Beethoven will do more than this in his development section, but still he's basically relied on this device, as you will hear. By comparison, the first movement development of Haydn's Symphony 102 that we examined was much more inventive than this. But Beethoven was just starting out here, still finding himself at age 29. So never fear, things would begin to change in his next symphony. So here is Beethoven's central development section as it occurs, and I'll call out the events as they happen. It's repeated now in sequences. Here it's in D major. Now in G major. And leading to a shadowy C minor. And there's the ascending triads. The triads continue through various harmonic regions. And here's that connecting theme. Now in E flat major with its downward scale. Now the main theme is passed around in the woodwinds and the low strings. It's a sequence now in F minor. Now we're in G minor. And now the main theme in a new version. And this woodwind phrase it's taken from the slow introduction. We're in the key of A minor, and we cadence now in a big unison E. And now the outline of the dominant chord. And our recapitulation in the full orchestra. And there's our recapitulation. And Beethoven sticks to the classical playbook, essentially repeats everything in order from the exposition. But now we stay in the home key of C major. Etc. Instead of, and not in G major as it was in the exposition. Etc. And just as in Mozart and Haydn, 
the symphonies that we've examined, the structure, the architecture of this movement is flawlessly shaped and balanced. And it's also clear. We recognize the themes from the exposition as they occur in the development section, then in the recap. But now there's a brief coda, which starts with a simple sequential treatment of the main theme, like so, leading to F major, and then leading to D major, and now finally to C major. Uh -huh. And those dynamic chords that we heard early in the exposition to get things really going, they now return in the coda, but now they have a new harmonic progression and a sort of dislocated rhythm between treble and bass, like so. which adds that extra burst of energy as the main theme now will propel us through to the end. And you'll hear the grand, sustained expanse of C major hovering throughout the entire orchestra with the main theme chugging away underneath. And the rising triad everywhere. And this is so similar to the end of the Mozart Symphony 34 first movement that we've explored. And I didn't plan it this way, but the carry through of the Mozartean model in its design, its spirit, and its sound is remarkable. Here's the coda now to the first movement. That's a masterclass in uh, first movement writing. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, um, for symphony. Yeah, there's nothing you can. F there's no flaw. It's perfect. It's so perfect. Absolutely, perfectly proportionate. And Beethoven was a very good mathematician, so he counted the measures yes. to keep the proportions uh, where they should be. And he was a, a child of enlightenment, as Larry mentioned in the previous program yeah. we saw. And the uh, you know enlightenment was um, fascination with the Greek um, concepts of proportion and harmonious um, yeah. relations between parts as, in, in within the whole. And of course, uh, you know one of the four front ideas in there was of the golden golden cut you know the yeah. proportion the archy arch yeah. development and the you know musicians spent uh, quite a bit of um scientific approaching music scientifically this the uh, development of, of the music through the time scientifically and yeah. the tempos and the metronomes were yeah. a big part and always are so uh, the number of measures and the um mm -hmm. developing towards the climax the length of the climax proportionate to the uh, climb up to the climax then decline the that proportion to the previous two and so forth and um it all expressed itself in um, measures by versus tempo of the <laughs> of the yeah. movement number of the beats and all that so uh, there's a, a lot of that background and uh, Beethoven definitely was aware of that like um you know sometimes it feels like well well, well why did he add all these additional uh, seemingly unnecessary chords at the end well yeah. Don't we all feel like, well, yeah, if you take them out, it feels incomplete. Yeah, and yeah, uh, yeah. yeah, part of the reason of that, he had arrived at the tonic and there's still a couple of measures left to complete the proportion. So he just adds the chords. <laughs> yeah, it's really quite fascinating to see him approach um, music like this because uh, this sort of approach to music is very it's done often with Bach's music this uh, idea of proportion and I think Bach also a fantastic mathematician and um, a genius of proportion understood a lot of these uh, how important it is and I'm really glad you bring it up because I think as much as music is in the space of time but it also exists in this um, in the 
dimension of space it takes up sort of room in our mind in our in the way we envision it and um it's really quite an intangible invisible thing when you play music because you're not really doing anything um physically uh in terms of creating something physically um but you, you have something on paper or you you play something and it exists in time and then it disappears and so to have proportion within that is um, very likened to the sort of architects of music idea, the architecture that is built. And of course, you don't really see it. If only we could see music in terms of architectural, architectural buildings, it would be very fascinating to see how Symphony Number no. 1 looks compared to Symphony Number no. 5 looks, you know, what kind of towers What a brilliant, interesting idea, Chris. Let's put it out to our um, viewers. All right, if there are aspiring architects in our audience yeah. um <laughs> yeah and if you get inspired by this idea to um transpose the uh, Beethoven symphony into a building uh you can use ai nowadays you don't even have to I use wonder a, if know, that would drawing be, yeah i wonder if that <laughs> would prompt be really for the cool ai <laughs> yeah exactly because then that that sort of yeah that would be really really creative to see what they would come up with and what, what would the pastoral symphony look like? Is it actually an actual building or does it, is it a, is it a Landscape forest? maybe, yeah, forest. Yeah, landscape. absolutely. So interesting. it's very interesting for us to think about, but that's really what, what we're talking about here. What is really applicable here is to see this sort of uh, proportion take our the space within our minds, I guess, is what it comes down to. The space within our minds, the space within our our listening, and our there's a sort of what they call people call the sound world or a or an oral dimension. But these are all just words to describe something that absolutely has very little to do with the emotions that you can feel coming up from hearing this kind of music with the rhythm and the harmonies. And what I love is it. Well, I love two things. First of all, how he finds his way to C major towards the end. You're like, oh, is he going to get there? Is he going to get there? And he gets there. That's very cool. And the other thing I love is also uh, how he ends the development. You know, and he's like, you, you end up with a E natural or, you know, and you're, you're, you're different keys for a while. And then you're like, oh, what's he going to do with that? And then he does this descending sort of, um, descending notes within the dominant seventh, I guess, of C major, and then gets back into it. And you're like, oh, of course, there, there we go. And I think that's that's really quite a wonderful, um, wonderful invention, like wonderful way to do it. And so, I yeah, it definitely is a sort of a peak preview at um, Beethoven as an innovator of the form and the use of the orchestra and use of the symphony form later. Um, just like uh, Lawrence Rapchak pointed out, the first symphony was very much confined to the um, rules of the time of creating the symphony. However, there are some Ill elements in, within that very um, prescribed structure, which Beethoven basically laid down the grid and filled it with his own um, semiotic material. There's still a lot of sort of peak previews at his innovativeness, uh, which is going to show that much more, much later down the road. And um, I wanted also to bring back the thought of uh, music and math mathematics and music and architecture and engineering um a, a, a lot of um bias and i, I believe that's mm -hmm. a misconception is that music lives in a different part of the brain and musicians are poor mathematicians and they're not so impractical and they don't know how to count money and that kind of stuff um history proves that um being just a misconception over and again um and with the um, with those lectures of uh, lawrence rapchick and Veiling the inner workings of Beethoven, uh, how he prepares the grid, how he uh, structures it, how he deals mm -hmm. with the balance of different proportions, lengths, and uh, ranges, and all that. It's it's not intuitive. I mean, it's intuitive too, but there's a, a lot of um, uh, abstract thinking involved. Let's say mathematics in its purest form is abstract. So is music um, mm. in, a, in a way. But that's where the two definitely converge in our creative process. And um, it's very interesting. And I think it's... A, it, uh, in addition to that being just interesting as a you know information, um, I think it's a good life lesson to people um, who 
I try to be um, practical with what they encounter, not, not just being consumers, but uh, learn lessons from everything they encounter, including Beethoven's music. Something which can help them uh, realize themselves in the spheres. Because, you know, if you think, okay, um, I'm very mathematical, therefore I'm not, mm. never going to play violin. Um, maybe you're uh, maybe you're going to play violin very well if you try it, yeah. if you didn't have that bias. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I think that's quite a, that's a very interesting idea. Well, I, I want to, before I forget, I want to also talk about how um, Larry Rapchak also gives a head nod in a way to Mozart. Um, I, it, it reminds me that, you know, a lot of the time our musical world is very interwoven with other people and our influences are really great. And what you mentioned before makes me think of, yeah, like how our world of music is is so broad and to be able to um for beethoven to acknowledge either acknowledge willingly or unwillingly mozart is also a really brilliant thing that larry captures that sort of idea very well yeah yeah that's that 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 little not so little but uh, uh, a nod to mozart's influence and um how at the at the beginning, Beethoven is mm. uh, looking for his own voice, and he basically steps on the shoulders of the best predecessors. He takes the best from everything that was available, and mind you, there was no internet in there. He couldn't look on IMSLP yeah, for the score true. of yeah. any Mozart symphony or anything. That that required active search and active. Um, being on, on the lookout and active research and being really, really act, proactively looking for those influences. And then also, uh, like for everything and everyone ever living, um, it's um, sorting out the um, the weeds because mm -hmm. um, Mozart was and Haydn were not the only composers who were around that time living. And uh, if we say today's, today's creative world is chaotic, and very hard to discern what's good, what's not so good, and what to take in and what to set aside right, and maybe right. not let that influence you. Um, that that's not new. <laughs> that's been always out there. There is scores and scores of names of composers who were uh, as big a name, or maybe even mm. bigger names than Mozart's and Haydn's name. It wasn't like a okay go to if you want a good influence. That's the people for you to to be influenced right. by. So even a very young Beethoven, he was just twenty nine when he composed that symphony. Even a very young Beethoven already had uh, uh, put a lot of effort into. Uh, deciding and choosing which influences to l let uh, let take a hold mm -hmm. and um, uh, let let be part of his creative process. Yeah, because I think ultimately, as you see later on in this life, Beethoven becomes more and more fascinated with Handel and then his and Handel's music. Um, he's also very much influenced by um the, the the historical and political times that are facing you know him and vienna and the people around him you see that this is a really integral part of being a an artist and it all interweaves i, I remember reading in a biography of beethoven that obviously mozart's sort of presence was very much in his mind as was haydn's when he was composing symphonies in general and just pieces of music because it's so um, any any great artist acknowledges the genius of other great artists and to create well, in a and, similar field. Yeah, and being able to recognize who those geniuses are. For us, it's kind of obvious. Of course, Mozart is a genius. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but that's, that, um, at the time. Mm -hmm. that's a 2020 vision in the rare mere view. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so back then, um, you know, if we also talk about all some genius not being recognized uh, during uh -huh. their time by other geniuses around them. Uh, <clears throat> look at the story between Chopin and Liszt. Chopin yeah, yeah, yeah. did not recognize Franz Liszt as a genius, not at all. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, th this is, th we just need to remember the world was in that sense no different from today. So our uh, curation of the art and you know, self curation or public curation of the art yeah. is never an easy thing. And um, for a very young Beethoven, I mean, I mean, he was still just learning. Basically, that symphony is a study score, uh, preparing for the next. Yeah. For for him to be so keenly aware of what's uh, the best around him, um, that's part of how he became who he became. 
Yeah, do do do, do certain um, in our modern world of composers and uh, do any sort of uh, maybe not in the living composers, but maybe the like the composers of the twentieth century. Do, are, do, are there any composers you think um, would, in your opinion, would start to stand the test of time? You feel like, oh, they, these are composers we're going to hear for the next 30 to 50 years and onwards because of not only their influence, but also their work and their uh, the, the playability of their music. For example, someone like um, Leonard Bernstein obviously stands uh, to mind. Uh, do you have any other musicians? Um, I mean, Ligeti, I think, also is starting to get this traction. Uh, I know he passed away only quite recently. Um, perhaps Lutoslavsky. Do, do any other musicians come to mind for you? That's Chris, this is a huge question. Let's maybe come back to that in a separate mm. program within our Music and Musicians from around the globe. Um, serious because this is a very important question and um, it uh, provokes a lot of thought mm -hmm. uh, especially you know once you ask who then the next question comes why <laughs> right <coughs> and I feel like um, it's uh, the who cannot be quite given due diligence without at least touching on the why's yeah yeah and i think i think of course it's a bigger topic i think it's just related to how we discuss beethoven as this monumental character i think it's also important for our um audience or for us to discuss hey what what are we looking forward to in our world today you know what what, what is applicable now so that we don't just uh i guess idolize these composers of the past but also continue to um look forward uh, with optimism just as Beethoven does in terms of what we have available in our and, it, and it's very interesting in our way in our daily work is like maybe one day in, in the future uh, we'll look back and it's the game uh, the composers for, for games or for for for, mu uh, for movies that's just this is, the, this is the music that will stand the test of time and we're not even expected I don't think perhaps people back in the day um would expect the music of J.S. Bach to stand the test of time for such a long time. And it was, if not for the work of um, Mendelssohn, perhaps. I think it's just fascinating how history continues to go. And we have very little control over who gets to last forever. That, that's a very, very good topic and very interesting. I really would love to explore it because um, especially where this question comes from, because, uh, you know, um, all of us, we do and we should value our time very much and value our output very much. So clearly we want to um, join the rank of those who are going to last. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, how do we do that? So we need to, like, Beethoven, how did he know that for him it was a good idea to learn from Mozart and Haydn and maybe not from Clementi? Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, how, how do we do it in today's world by um, uh, how do we f um, join the stream of creating music or performance, whatever that is, or PD, yeah. uh, which is going to build the legacy as opposed to uh, lead us to the dead end of, of uh, forgive, forget, being forget, forgotten. Yeah, absolutely. So, that's yeah. very important. And, um, you know, sometimes people just dismiss it. Okay, well, I'm not genius enough to even tackle that. Not true. <clears throat> That's how you discover your genius, by actually tackling those questions. Because I think so. Beethoven did. <laughs> Yeah, and I think well, we'll, t we'll discuss this more in our next um, part, of, of course, and I want to make sure we um, do that because I think it's, it, music is something that's con very fluid in, in within the history of our existence and obviously there's so many different factors that influence it. But for now, I want to thank our team and our collaborators, particularly New Media Productions, our virtual concert halls, Architects of Music and Larry Abchak. If you enjoyed this show, please consider subscribing and following us and sending us some comments or feedback as well. Yes, uh, visit, visit our channels. Our virtual concert halls is now broadcasting on over 50 channels and mm -hmm. um, uh, platforms all over the world, uh, which are dedicated to providing uh, great content of mm -hmm. um, music mm -hmm. and musicians and uh, various programs. And of course, please visit our websites. You see on the screen those websites and um, check out 
other events and other possibilities, <clears throat> both yeah. for audience members and for uh, actual creators, uh, musicians, composers, performers, uh, music organizations, and so forth. Uh, we are expanding our reach and we always look for new collaborations. Absolutely. And so this has been part three. It's been such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for watching. And I hope to see you next time for part four of our Beethoven 1 documentary series. Bye yes. Now. Bye now. No matter where you are or who you are, music connects us all. We started with a dream, but now we are paving the future. Welcome to the Sound Espressiva Global Competition. Fully virtual, yet bringing musicians closer together than ever before, now on a global scale. True live, inclusivity, diversity, connection, community, an extraordinary array of judges. Get noticed by companies all over the world. Prizes, scholarships, performance opportunities. Apply to be a part of the most exciting congregation of artists like nothing you've ever seen before. We guarantee quality and leave no musician behind. We can't wait to hear you on the virtual stage.